So hello, welcome back today. Unbelievable but true. We have Mr. Michael Hobson, founder of Classic Records, here on, on my channel. Unbelievable. <laughs> let, let me state that. And we would love to talk. We would like to talk about Classic Records, the label. He, uh, he will show us some unbelievable items. And we also talk about, and maybe we start with that, we also talk about the auction of the Michael Hobson archive. I think it's up to in, in, in 14 days, I think, around that timing. And, and maybe we start with that and, and maybe Michael tell us what and why and why are you selling right. this unbelievable archive? Well, first of all, let me just say it's a real pleasure to be on your channel, and um, I'm greatly appreciative for that. And um, the answer the, to the question is that uh, I've had a lot of these items now for about 20 years, coming up on 27 years uh, from the very beginning. What we did was we, um, from the onset, one of the things, and part of this comes from the fact that prior to starting Classic Records, I was both um, an audiophile personally, but also had a, a hi-fi store in lower Manhattan. And so both of those led to that kind of collector mentality, even being in the record business. So it was sort of like, well, you know, if we're going to press this, I, I need to have some copies in my archive. And so we actually started two archives kind of simultaneously. One was um, the so-called classic records archive, which um, ended up going to Chad Kassam. And I think he's sold that off kind of in pieces, albeit I think a big chunk of it, as I understand, I don't know this, the details of it, but a big chunk of it, I think went to one big collector. So somebody there has that. That's more of a true archive in the sense that as things were made, there was a, a test pressing and a production copy and those were put into that archive. And uh, so uh, at the same time, um, I started an archive that was a little more special. And that was, we made an effort to get copies from what we consider to be the sweet spot of the stamper, the first stamper. And that's usually about 100 to 150 pressings in, okay? okay? And we've done experiments to, mm -hmm. I know that this will probably light a few people on fire. <laughs> You'll think, Always you know, creating a new hype. <laughs> this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, but I promise you in 18 years of, um, you know, being obsessed with vinyl and test pressings and so forth, there are lots of things to uncover. And that's one of them. And it makes sense, right, that there's a kind of a, a build up, a bell curve, if you will, uh, and then where things decline somewhat thereafter. And I'm gonna talk about the huge differences. This is not like one's mm, and the is mediocre and the sweet yeah. spot of the but what have what have fantastic. we learned? What have we learned from Bernie Grantman? Every detail counts. <laughs> it does. It does. Um, and and that's absolutely the case. So that was what set my archive apart, is that um, it, it had that extra feature to it, if you will. Now, unfortunately, as is always the case with archives, no matter how um, specific you are in the instructions, if it's over a long period of time, you have different people that work for you that are involved and you give them the same instructions, but <laughs> Sometimes they don't carry them out exactly as you um, intended. So um, I would say that what I have, it's the number one of five, and I'll explain that in just a second. The number one of five Hobson um, Classic Records Archive. 
and that's their numbered editions. And it doesn't mean that number one is any better mm -hmm. sounding than number five. Uh, they're all, those are all probably equal. Of course, collector wise and psychologically, <laughs> there's, you know, uh, some kind of um, bragging rights, if you will, uh, yes. among collectors. So just a, you know, a sense of I have the number one. And, um, and so, and, and they are all, all uh, uh, um, packed. They are all st still in shrink wrap. They are, yes, unlisten. Yeah. They are mint. mint. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> as, as much as they can be. I mean, Perfect. and here's the other thing that um, I want to make clear to everyone that I have opened pristine copies of records, and you know, there's. A little something you know maybe oh. something in the lead-in group or there's a, a little tick that sometimes you know you can you you can clean you know i've um one of those record cleaners that uh, is ultrasonic and quite often some of the anomaly or the uh, issues left behind by mold release that's in uh, pvc compound for records mm. can be cleaned away and it makes a pretty dramatic difference yeah. I, I just can agree to that one point. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and, and what, what I really liked about your, your selling is that you say, I want to sell it to one person. I want to keep that archive together if, if possible. Right? Yeah. Uh, and, and that is my intent. Mm -hmm. um, as, as I've said before, um, because we've, more or less sold off kind of three through five. Mm -hmm. And I have more or less number two for mm -hmm. myself, right? Mm -hmm. Just for my own. Okay. The realization set in after a while. I'm, I'm a little obsessive. I've mentioned that before. <laughs> and so, um, you know, does it really make sense to have five copies of every release? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I thought the same thing for 27 years, right? <laughs> But guess what? That takes up a lot of space. And, really? <laughs> yeah, it's shocking, right? But, um, and like, you know, the, the reality is how many of those are you going to play? So what's the real issue here? And so the, I'd like it to be, as the archive notion suggests, mm -hmm. I'd like it to be in the hands of someone who can appreciate it, either by playing it and enjoying it or by having it as a store of value. I mean, we know that these things grow in value over time, yeah. right? At, least at the moment, they um, extremely do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. so, and a lot of these things will never be made again. Right. So um, no matter um, how successful Chad is in trying to press a number of things, as we've talked about before, there just isn't enough time. Right. Exactly. exactly. Too many other things to do. I mean, you can't. You, it would take you 18 years. Yeah, it took you 18, 18 years. Uh, of course, it took you. And maybe now let's let's get a little bit for all of you get into the history how how does this beautiful archive of yours came together over the years um you did it in a time and that is what always strikes me as a collector when it comes to classic records you've put out hendrix led zeppelin the who <laughs> peter gabriel wow uh, collectors Audiophiles dream in un unbelievable good uh, 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 editions. But in a time, at least at the beginning, when nobody talked about the vinyl explosion or something, that quite quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. How come? How, how was it? Uh, didn't the most people tell you, you want to start vinyl? Are you crazy nowadays? The CD is the thing uh, we need, we want. How was it? Well, that's a very good question. And I think it speaks to um, <clears throat> if, if I do have a, a, any sort of modicum of talent, 
it's at least in part the ability to see opportunities that exist in the market. And it's incredibly opportune that um, you are uh, a German national, you live in Germany. And so there's part of this story that really has to do with Germany in the, in the 90s, um, into the, the 80s into the 90s. And it kind of is a replication of what's going on now that you and I have talked about before, that pressings <clears throat> from the United States are not so easy to get in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. And that's true today with reissues, but it was true in the 50s and the 60s mm -hmm. with regard to original pressing. So roll the tape forward to the late 80s, the early 90s, and there was this big rush uh, in the world market actually, driven mostly by Germany, uh, some other places, to get these living stereo pressings, right? right. And of course, culturally, um, you know, I, at least my impression is that, that Germans are more steeped in classical music Right. So Maybe, yeah. Maybe. everybody was was, you know, more than Americans, I think we're not mm -hmm. necessarily brought up on classical music like yeah. is the tradition in Europe generally, but Germany specifically. Yeah. So you had these German collectors, um, you know, looking for all of these uh, original living stereo pressings and a few in particular that they were after were the Royal Ballet. Right. Mm -hmm. Which you know, we, we replicated, right? I've, I've showed you this before, I think. Um, this is, so this is, one, this is one of the archive copies, right? This is number two of four, right? But number one is, is safely in a box in my temperature control basement. But this is the Soria box, right? And it's, you know, kind of a linen, it's got a dowel edge, you know, um, and, and it's, it was a, an incredible addition. It didn't sell very well here in the United States huh? because a couple of reasons. One, it was expensive, right? right? What, was, was, what was expensive at that time? If I well, may. so as an example, mm -hmm. um, when stereo records came out from RCA, I think they were $4.99. And mono records were $3.99. Mm -hmm. You already had an issue there where stereo records were were more expensive. But when you get a Sori edition like this, a two record set, in the day, in the early 60s, this, I believe, went for about $20 or close yeah. to $20, okay. right? And so they didn't, it, and the second part is that it was a famous conductor in Europe, Ernst Anseme, right? Very well respected, but not really known here in, well in the United States. Mm -hmm. So those two things combined but the recording, a DECA recording with the DECA tree at um, Kingsway is, it's one of the most astonishing uh, stereo orchestral recordings. It's, it's just beautiful. So it was highly sought after around the world. And particularly in Germany, it's like, they, you know, those collectors were just, it was even harder for them to get it, right? So the prices just kept getting yeah. bid up. Yeah. Uh, the the first record we put out that the the royal ballet we put out i think in the beginning of year two which would have been 1995 um we announced it at the end of 1994 and just you know everybody got freaked out even more so than when we announced the whole living stereo series mm -hmm. right? because that was part of the deck what we call the deca rcas yeah. which were deca recordings that were licensed by RCA, they were not owned by RCA oh, USA. Yeah. They were licensed mm -hmm. and put out under the RCA Living Stereo, mm -hmm. like to enhance the number of recordings they could put out in stereo, right? Because stereo was the new big thing, yeah. and and so those rights after some time reverted back to Decca. So when I put that record out, um, I had to go to Decca to license the the title, and I had to go to RCA to license the artwork. Okay. Right? So it was kind of, and I already had a relationship with RCA, so that wasn't so hard. Mm -hmm. And I was doing RCA living stereo. So when I went to DECA, they were like, oh yeah, you know, we can, we can revive some of these things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the point is that that and the Alzo Sprock Zarathustra LSC 1806 were 
I mean, just people were just dying to get a hold of them because the magazines had hyped these as being these, you know, stellar recordings and, you know, you could evaluate your equipment your, and your system sounded like you were at Orchestra Hall yeah. or at Kingsway. And so, you know, it, uh, very rare items for the reasons I've already mentioned. And a lot of people chasing them meant the prices went really high. And so I looked at this and I went, and being an audiophile and being a hi-fi shop owner, I'm like, yeah, yeah. I think I think we we can make some we can yeah. we can bring some great things out here. Coupled with the fact that that was more or less the low point for vinyl, certainly in the United States, it was still alive, although barely in Europe. There were still German pressings. There were still UK pressings, mostly of new stuff, right? At that time, I and I was buying that stuff as well, like new releases of stuff, not necessarily yeah. issues. And certainly, there was almost no classical, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, a unique set of opportunities and so forth. And I think, as I've told people before, the the thing that made this go was that we went into RCA and said. We don't want one, you know, we don't want just the Zarathustra or Pines of Rome or, you know, the famous things. We want 20. And we're so you make a whole series of, of make of, a series. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, for collectors, that's something important. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So what also I kind of realized was that Chad, who actually was in the reissue business before War Classic, mm -hmm. right, and others, and we've spoken about some of those guys before. Mm -hmm we're doing kind of onesie twosies. They would do a title and then three months later, four mm -hmm. months later, they'd be in, another title would get announced. And, you know, at that rate, the, the audiophile vinyl business was never gonna come back. It took, and I, I actually didn't realize it at the time, but in hindsight, the whole idea that someone would commit to doing a series that people could know about and look forward to, yeah. It changed everyone's mentality. I, I, I can really imagine that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so, so you started with the RCA Living Stereos. Right. And, and you finished them completely and then went on to the next releases or? No, or... No. no, because um, also keep in mind, like in another great tie, European tie into this is that we had a distributor in Germany at the time, mm -hmm. uh, Alto High Fidelity. I don't think it, it mm -hmm. exists now, but mm -hmm. it was around and they, they distributed, I think, equipment and records. And the classical titles, if I recall correctly, they were taking like two or 3,000 copies per release. Okay. I mean, out of the gate, it's like pallets of stuff mm -hmm. were going over to Europe mm -hmm. again because there was an appetite for mm -hmm. this really classical music on audiophile vinyl, mm -hmm. for, you know, generally, but mm -hmm. RCAs, which were really scarce mm -hmm. specifically. So um, that, that was what, but, but, but we realized, and, and it was a success here in the United States too. It got people who weren't necessarily classical listeners, audiophiles, into classical music. And so I think that was a real accomplishment from my standpoint is that because of the magazines had hyped these recordings mm -hmm. and now we're bringing them back at prices that everyone could afford, right? I mean, imagine if you could find a copy of the Royal Ballet. I sold my original copy to a German collector for $1,800 okay. in 1993. Yeah, this right. is an iconic. Uh, the, and that, yeah. I put the money into starting classic records, mm. right? Okay. So if you could buy an edition of that for 40 bucks, it, even in the original story, it's like, you know, yeah. I too. Mm -hmm. And people did. But mm -hmm. we realized that classical was not enough to uh, satisfy the market. So late in 1994, we announced... Uh, the first jazz titles and uh, uh, then the next thing were jazz yeah okay and and all of them are on uh, 33 and a third right or did you do 45s at that point of the, yeah. 
So that that's an, a great question too. Um, the way the 45, so the answer is that almost everything was cut at 45 in addition to 33 after a certain point. And, and I'll, mm -hmm. I'll explain that. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, the first three titles were LSC 1806, the Zarathustra with Reiner 1954 recording. And then LSC 1817, which is the Gaete Parisian recording that was done not much after that in 1954 at Boston Orchestra Hall uh, or Boston Symphony Hall with Arthur Fiedler. And, and the third title we put out, interestingly, um, was a, the Lalo Symphony Espanol, LSC. Mm -hmm. uh, Great one. Mm -hmm. 2456. It's got, and that was again Reiner at Chicago Symphony Hall, a, a little later recording. And um, in it, with those first three titles, so we got the tapes, right? And we were having this, I was having this discussion with Grunman and um, we're talking about 33 and 45. And so we talked about the issues around why 45 sound better. And I have to admit to you, honestly, uh, in 1994, even though I thought I knew a lot about records and hi-fi and so forth, I really didn't fully understand why it was that 45s are better. It's got a cutting head on it. And that cutter head is moving back and forth and up and down if it's stereo, right? Driven by an amplifier that comes from the two track analog tape, right? Mm -hmm. So when you think about it, the, the difference between a 33 and a 45 is only how fast the lacquer is spinning on the platter. Mm -hmm. The cutter head doesn't know. It's still just doing its thing, right? He, he does the same, right. Uh, right. Now, that's not true at half speed, right? Mm -hmm. there, that's a different story, and, and I won't go into that. But, but so it was explained that the groove modulation in time if you stretch it out over a longer period or a longer piece of groove, any, at any point, the modulation is not as great. The overall from here to here, climbing the hills the same, but it's over a different period of time. So from, to get from here to here is a more gentle slope, which means that the cartridge is more able to more accurately get every nuance of the groove modulation. And that's really the issue at hand is that okay. it's really about cartridge tracking, to be honest. Okay. If you had the perfect cartridge, it wouldn't matter. Okay, 30, okay, three okay, okay but perfect is something. <laughs> but, but cartridges have, you know, compliance issues. And, and when, especially when there's a lot of dynamic range, when there's a lot of either side to side or up and down vertical. Cartridges, you know, they, they distort. And so there's less distortion, let's call it, play, playback distortion mm -hmm. at 45 than there is at 33. So, so we did this experiment and it was with LSC 1806. And it was kind of like, well, let's try one. So we cut, uh, I think two lacquers and it was part of the first uh, intro to the, um, the beginning of Zarathustra, the famous beginning, da, da, da. It's, it's the sunrise. So we cut that, not the whole side, but just part of it. And then Grunman faded at a point. And then we, on side two of that release, we cut some more and, and faded to that as well as a comparison. We had it test pressed, you know, plated and test pressed and so forth. And when I listened to it versus the 33, and again, there it was from the same tape, the same setup, the same everything, right? They were all played at the same time. It was like, oh, the same my master God. engineer, yeah. everything, yeah. everything the same. It was so like, fun. oh yeah. my God, mm -hmm. this is, and as an audiophile, I knew that people would buy this. Mm -hmm. So we made a decision at that point to cut again, more or less everything at 
45 simultaneously with the idea that we could come back and you know extend the license of the title yeah. and put it out on 45 and people would buy it again mm -hmm. and they did and that's what started that whole process and so throughout the archive for example there mm -hmm. are a lot of 45 editions uh, many of which are long out of print mm -hmm. and the reason for that is I, I may have mentioned to you before that often the limiting factor of a 45 edition is the jacket because our idea was always to put out the four disc set and yeah. I can talk one about that but it was with it with an art jacket because you know even if you're buying it at 45 you still want to see what the art's like right it's sure. you know, that's part of the thing so sometimes we would order a certain number of jackets and let's say that the 33 sold really really well and you only had 400 jackets left well you know it, it's expensive and wasteful to go back and print more mm -hmm. jackets and so forth so that became the limiting factor mm -hmm. and um, inadvertently we created some titles which were are, are rarer and more sought after than others not on purpose mm -hmm. by accident as okay. i just described yeah and, and have, yeah. am i right when i say that <clears throat> your 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 releases weren't intended at limited editions they weren't right or or have you said we are we are doing 5000 and that's it never you did never you did never do that right right and and part of that was as a collector I recognized a couple of things that um, these numbered editions, quote unquote, are uh, drive people crazy and they, they lead to a kind of a false perception. So um, for example, and this relates to the kind of blue. So is, you know, copy 500 of Chad's reissue gonna be, um, discernibly different from copy 2300 no i'm guessing you're going to have a hard time and people will argue oh well it's another stamper and this and that's like I, you think I, that you think there will be differences there will be but it'll probably be more about where in the stamper yeah exactly exactly yeah that right. that's my suspicion yeah. about yeah, but that you have always you always have that uh, if you do 1000 or 20000 within the stamper you have differences yeah. yeah within each stamper you have differences oh. right so i my suspicion is that's what would happen there but anyway the point is that there's a people don't they think of the higher numbers as not as desirable and no, uh, you know, they, yeah but that's you know also, you know this thing with the numbers i, I i've said that uh, quite some time here on my channel uh, there is nobody there are not two people two michaels and they said michael i now have uh, 101 can you please give me the 101st pressing i said yeah michael here is of course not <laughs> it's difficult to do that it's really difficult we, uh, we tried and we've we, did? we were we were somewhat successful, but we okay. it, it takes a lot of effort. We'll put it that way. So, <laughs> I can imagine uh, that. But but the other thing, so uh, the other thing is it's it's limiting, and so sometimes if you, you have to pick the right, what's the right number, right? So for example, I don't know, but my assumption is that it went after these twenty five thousand are sold out of kind of blue from Chad, which I think they are technically yeah. sold out now then what i mean is it just now the secondary market i mean he sold out in two months time and so you press them you make a bunch of money and a lot of people got them out there then what probably the secondary market if there's more demand what we'll see yeah, is that in the secondary market these things will be 300 bucks 500 bucks right yeah that's what I, we I'm see not every that. day now but but on the on the other hand i think it was um, very, uh, I don't know the English word right now. It was courageous to do 25K. I, I, I mean, compare, compare that to, to uh, 1,000 uh, of Lush Life on, on the small batch. This was um, courageous to do. And I think 25K is okay because everybody who wants to get this record within a time frame could get it. 
and then I think it's 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 all right to do it that way. Yeah. Now, all of that said, I I will tell you a story that um, some people don't really know about the beginning of Classic Records. Mm -hmm. That is that <clears throat> after we announced all these titles, mm -hmm. we also announced that you could pre-order. Okay, that was something new at the time. You okay. could pre-order the first 10 titles and you got a special box, okay? Good. I just, I, you just reminded me of this. Okay. <laughs> so here, here it is. This is the Classic Records Deluxe 1S box, right? And, you know, this, um, you know, it has all the, the first 10 pressings in it and so forth. And they're all, they're all from the first stamper because what we did was cool. when a new title, because we didn't release them all at the same time, it took mm -hmm. a year. So we would, and it was a pain in the butt. We had to take <laughs> 500 of each of these because that's, yeah. I think, that's how many there were. We had to take 500 of each of them and put them aside. We had to, and then lo like load them into the box after, at the end, we loaded them in the box. And, you know, I think it took us nine months actually to put them on. <laughs> and then people bought this box, but they prepaid for it. And I just want to say that to all the people, that in 1994 mm -hmm. believed in us, mm -hmm. they prepaid. And, mm -hmm. you know, I can't quite remember what it was, but I think it was $400, which was $10 yeah. more per <coughs> copy than if you just bought them individually, right? Okay. So if you bought them without the box, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the, the lure was, the, the, it was, they were all from the first stamper, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say to those people, of which there are many Germans that did this, that you know we're appreciative because of that money you could go on you know? advance is what capitalized mm -hmm. classic records. Because mm -hmm. I, you know, I did. I, mm -hmm. I had an audio store in New York City. You're mm -hmm. certainly not going to get rich off an audio store, and um, and so that was. Uh, it really the the vinyl lovers and the vinyl fans. Um, they they capitalized oh. the, the beginning of classic records, and I'm yeah, great yeah because it was, I, in my opinion, it was a very very smart move to say we keep them coming, we keep them coming. It, it will be a collection. You can build up something. It's not only now and then, and we will see what we say. This 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 in this time frame, and this this was quite new at the time. Um, yeah, I think it was something, there was a lot to look forward to. Exactly. So exactly, and then okay. and then you you came up with the first jazz titles, uh, would have a uh, prestige or or, or or what was it? Verve. We started with Verve. Verve. Okay. Right, and um, you know because there were some amazing Verve titles mm -hmm. um, like uh, let's see if I pulled that out. I thought I did. Um, no, I don't think I pulled it out, but I can hold hold on just a second. So. Here we go. So I just grabbed a copy of one of the great verb titles we put out, and this was an insanely rare record uh, in stereo. There were a lot of monos. And, and none of them were really in good shape, to be honest. It's this Billie Holiday, Songs of Distingue Lovers, right? Norman Grands produced this. And this happens to be the, the 45 RPM edition, right? Uh, we put it out on 33, but we cut it at 45. Yeah. And I think, um, if I recall correctly, there's only six songs, right, on the, on the record. Mm -hmm. And so it came out as a two record set at 45. And one of the things, as an example of back to the archive, um, we had planned on going back and licensing this. In fact, I think, if I recall correctly, this, this 45 came out when the 45 series first started. You see the sticker, right? That's in the days when we were you know, putting stickers on, kind of a promotional thing with the cuts and so forth. And, um, this was pressed at RTI on the an SMT at um, 
you know, with, with the vinyl of the time, right? Roll the tape forward 16, 17 years, and we had planned on going back and relicensing the title for 45 to put out on 200 gram at, you know, with Clarity Vinyl. Mm -hmm. And so we, we pressed some, um, this is the Billie Holiday, the same as that other edition you saw, but pressed on Clarity Vinyl. And this is a test pressing box that- Can you please uh, unbox that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I could. Actually, actually I, I wouldn't mind doing it because this is a copy, this is my copy out of, you know, the, what I'm keeping, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> keep it close. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, there are a lot of items in the archive, in my archive, the MH Classic Records archive that were not in the Classic Records archive. And the reason is because the Classic Records archive was only things we put out. Okay, right? this, this has never seen daylight, this release on Clever. You, no. you thought about it, but then you said, no, we, we don't no. license it, or you, we don't. Not. Or no, 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 it, it's not, it wasn't that. It was that Classic Records got sold to Chad. Okay, okay. Right? So, so this you know, is quite a valuable record you just showed us, I guess. <laughs> I mean, if you're looking for a Clarity Vinyl of mm -hmm. um, that release, and I think Bernie Grunman did an amazing job. We had the original, two-channel session master um, okay. because back in those days what's interesting uh, especially with Verve mm -hmm. is that they didn't have you know a session master and a production master the the session master was the one that was used and mm -hmm. uh, so we were able to use that that original session master and um, yeah it's 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 Billie Holiday mm, arguably at her peak yeah. in the vinyl era. Yeah. Uh, if, I think most people would agree that Billie Holiday was at her peak during the 78 days, right? Prior to LP. And of course, you know, tragically she had some uh, problems with addiction and it ultimately um, affected her, her voice and, and took her life at the end. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah, this is one of those great recordings we did. And then we cut that at 45 as well and just sat on it. And interestingly, you know, cutting a title at 45 yeah. involves all of this. In fact, it's much more expensive. It, well, we'll put it this way. It goes along for the ride after you've done the mastering, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've mastered the title for 33, You've got the it's mastered already, so it's just one more run of the tape, right? As I as I mentioned to you before, mm -hmm. the cutterhead's just like, okay, we'll play that again, right? You just change the speed of the turn turntable on the lathe, and so. But in our well, in all cases, it, it, it doesn't matter how it comes out. In other words, whether they're single sided pressings, you still have to cut a lacquer per side, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And at forty five. You can't get all the songs generally. Sometimes you can, but generally you can't get all the songs from a side on. So it's twice the number of sides. And so just as an example, back in the day, cutting 45s and getting them plated. So Grunman was probably, was probably another 150 bucks per side, mm. right? That's time and material. And then plating, I think, per side, silvering and, and, and pulling and having a mother made and so forth was another 175 bucks, right? So now oh. you're at, at three over $300 for one, one of four. So let's just say it's 300 bucks times four exactly. is $1,200 that you just pay for and put the plates, you know, in, in storage. And so we did that uh, anticipating that, and I knew, I, I felt this, that, that we could convince people that 45 was, if, if you were a lunatic, right? If you didn't mind up getting up to change the side. <laughs> Same old story, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> not for not for the martini drinkers, but that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> so, <funny. laughs> so, so it does, by the way, though, if you're a martini drinker or a wine drinker like I am, it gives you more opportunities to go to the bathroom. Right? So you get up, you, you get a change of side, you get a you know potty break and, and off you go. But my point is that um, so there were there are still a, a lot of things um, that classic records cut that Chad has the parts for that he could license and put out. And mm -hmm. so some of those things, and this is back to the Billie Holiday, right? This, this rare edition. And I think there might be five copies of this, right? Wow. It's that kind now of I want record. to have that record and I will <laughs> never, never have it. <laughs> yeah. So, but he's got, there, there are a lot of parts like mm -hmm. um, most of the Blue Note catalog. Mm -hmm. um, we, we cut at, in fact, I think all of the Blue Note catalog. And here's an interesting aside for you. Mm -hmm. And that is with regard to the Blue Notes and 45 and so forth. We put quite a few of them out at 45 mm -hmm. on single-sided pressings. Mm -hmm. But we also cut, by the way, all the monos of some of the great, great titles, right? Some mm -hmm. of which didn't have stereo, right? Mm -hmm. Like the famous Hank Mobley record, BN 1568, mm -hmm. no stereo, right? It's all, it's just mono. So, so you put that out and, um, we put it out with a mono, we did it with a mono cutting head. Right? Okay. Mm. So there's only lateral, there's no vertical, right? And mm. I don't know if, if people know about this or not, but mono records cut on a stereo lathe, right? Which is the 4545 where you've got vertical and, and horizontal. If you play back a mono record, that's cut on a stereo lathe versus the same thing cut on a mono lathe, you can different. hear a difference. And the difference is interesting. It's the, the mono plate on a stereo has a more of a perception of uh, kind of a stereo um, soundstage, not completely, but kind of more. Well, and, that, yeah. and that's because the stereo cutting head has is the, the two the two channels are not ever perfect in in line with one another mm -hmm. so you've got a mono signal to both but so there is some up and down <clears throat> which gives you kind of a, a little bit of a phantom mm -hmm. stereo effect mm -hmm. when you hear a mono record cut on a mono lathe played back it it's yes it's all dead center mm -hmm. with you know but it is incredibly precise it's and, and it's so amazing. right into the face that's really a great it, listening experience I, I it, totally it really agree. is everything tightens up so you know that there's some level of we'll call it cutting distortion really that's not representing that mono take anyway the reason i bring that up is because chad has a lot of the parts that have never come out and we didn't test press them that's the other part of this problem here i've already described to you that if you have if you do these 45s and you're planning on putting them out at some later point, it's like at least 1200 bucks is, you know, you're, you're investing in, in an uncertain future. Mm -hmm. If you decide to make a stamper and do test pressings, that's another 300, $400 to do test pressings of which you get 10. So, mm -hmm. but also not, it's not just the money to do test pressings. Where are you going to put them all? Right. You do, 10 test pressings of a 45 RPM edition is four discs. That's 40 discs, you know, that's that many records. Yeah, but what's, what's, so fascinating, what's so fascinating with classic records, you didn't stop at that point. Now we are doing 45s, perfect world, all good. You even went a step ahead with a single sided 45s. Yeah. And I always felt really strongly about that. And I'll tell you the backstory. I don't know many people know this, mm -hmm. actually. Um, I remember, and, and I'll give, I always give credit to those people who lent insight to me. I remember um, I was um, very friendly and knew uh, Harry Weisfeld at VPI. And of course, at that time, when I first started Classic Records, I was actually living in New Jersey, not far from uh, 
Harry and his wife who has passed. Uh, and uh, so I would actually go down and visit them sometimes. I sold their cleaning machines and so on. And I remember talking to Harry and him saying to me, well, you know, and this is, by the way, before I was in the record business. In other words, I was still in the hi-fi business. And I was chatting with him one time and he said, you know, and he's had this pressing, this test pressing or a pressing that was single sided. Mm -hmm. And and he explained to me that those sounded better than the same record with grooves cut or pressed on the other side. In other words, have another stamper on the other side. And, and when I inquired why, he explained in a way that made enormous sense to me. And, and we, we proved it later on. It's, it's very demonstrable. And that is that when you have a four, 45 RPM cut and you've got a stylus in the groove, right? It's creating resonance, mm -hmm. right? It's creating uh, some vibration, right? Outside of just getting the groove modulation and turning that into an electrical signal that can be amplified and listened to. So you've got you know, some, some noise going on that's created by the physical contact oh. of, a, of, of a stylus in the groove. Of course, we know from turntables and the most exotic of which, there's always some attempt at making a platter that can absorb that resonance because what you don't want is to create a feedback so that the cartridge now gets some of that vibration back and distorts, right? Any, anything that, that distorts the stylus from exactly tracking the groove, you can hear. And it's, it, it gets amplified through the, the chain and so forth. So that vibration, Harry described to me, <clears throat> creates standing waves in the grooves underneath the record, not allowing that resonance that's created to escape or to be absorbed into the platter uniformly. Okay. So if you've got a flat surface and it's in intimate contact, and of course, you know, sometimes you do that with vacuum, sometimes you do it with a clamp and so forth, that allows for better absorption of this um, playback resonance, let's call it. And as a result, again, better playback, everything gets sharper. That's what happens when you play a single-sided pressing versus a two-sided 45 pressing. And I promise you, you can hear it. We've demonstrated it. I've done it many times before. It's like you can hear it. And if I have to say, and this is not a criticism of some of the people who followed after us with 45 editions, um, we all know who those are. Um, there is their ha they handicapped themselves by doing a two-sided pressing as opposed to a single-sided pressing. So um, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's less money. You make more. You don't have to charge as much. I mean, well, you charge the same really, and you but you make more money. And my thought always, Michael, from the beginning was that. If you're gonna do 45s, and it's because it's crazy, right? You do four sides. You, if you're gonna do this, you might as well do everything possible to make it sound. Because there's go, no go the to whole go. nine yards. Yeah, go exactly. That was go my attitude. Yeah. Right, and that that came from you know being an audiophile in the in the hi-fi business. Mm -hmm. It's like you know if we're gonna do this, let's let's do it right. Right. If there was anything else, least, I could have done. At least what I really like, just <clears throat> try it and, and look what happens. In theory, it's not always the same as in reality. So I, I really like that. And then, of course, I, I have to, I have to uh, talk about your Led Zeppelin releases. Because you know, <laughs> no, no, nowadays, I, mm. I, I, I try to imagine if, if any company uh, now announced Let's say a UHQR 45 RPM version of Led Zeppelin one or whatever or two or three or all of them. It, it would be an outrage. It would be turmoil. I, I don't know how many copies uh, they will sell. How was it in your time when you decided let's do Led Zeppelin? 
can you can you give share us some insights into that time how, how was it yeah sure um it's it's i i've i'm on record before as saying that uh, success begets success mm -hmm. right so you use what you've done to uh, get more and we had um, a relationship with the who and mm -hmm. um, it turns out <clears throat> i didn't just put out lps from the who we also not classic records another company that i started called the music mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we started doing live concert recording and that was called the encore series and we had a relationship with the who well it turns out that the who were managed by the same management company trenfold management in the uk uh bill kerbishley and robert rosenstein rosenthal rosenstein uh, sorry um <clears throat> And so I was able to go, see, in order to do something like Led Zeppelin or the Beatles or Pink Floyd or any of those, where there are uh, band members that are still alive, mm -hmm. is you really have to have the management on board, right? And yeah. because partly because the management talks to the band members. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the right place to go to 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 start that process. And of course, <clears throat> there are famous bands, uh, Led Zeppelin among those, where, you know, there's been, you know, some disagreements <laughs> within the band over time. Uh, I can imagine. Uh, yeah, I've heard something about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I, I, it's, I know this is a little inside information, but... <laughs> Sometimes they end up like the rest of us, not talking to each other. <laughs> Imagine that. So management tends to be the place where that can happen. And with Led Zeppelin, the 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 person who is, um, I'll say, the most important to deal with, and this is not a mm -hmm. reflection of the importance of any member in the band, but there's usually somebody who kind of is the the band member who yeah. is either the hardest to persuade or the keeper of the of the tapes or whatever. In the case the of vault, Crosby, the vault <laughs> so, yeah, the Vaultmeister, right? So, in this case, all roads lead to Jimmy Page, <clears throat> and so you know we had entree to Page, and we presented and sent him pressings and so forth. And, and you know, what can I say? You know, there was some probably some competitiveness there. It's like, well, these guys are doing this incredible job with Hendrix and the Who and mm -hmm. so on. It's like, well, Led Zeppelin deserves that as well. Now, I don't know that to be the case, but mm -hmm. that's my story and I'm sticking okay. to it. Um, but I, I'm really grateful that uh, management and Jimmy and the other band members had to sign off as well, John Paul Jones and, mm -hmm. and so on. So, um, so that was the first part of the process and it's really interesting. We were dealing directly, we licensed the titles from Atlantic, right? Because they were the rights owners in the United States. And, and I and I have from to- the beginning, oh, excuse me, one question. Uh, yeah. From the beginning you said, we are doing all Led Zeppelin. Or did exactly. you- oh, oh. <clears throat> No, exactly. That, that was the play. <clears throat> it was to Led Zeppelin, it was like, we want to do the whole thing. <laughs> right not just one two not we don't just want to do led zeppelin four and how's you know it's like let's do the whole thing it's a series <clears throat> and i will say that i think classic records kind of made that uh idea famous in a certain way or or fashionable i guess is a better way to put it like we were just like we're going to do the entire who series the whole thing we're going to do peter gabriel front mm -hmm. to back mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Um, and so people liked that. It was of like, course. well, you know, mm. so I think that also probably, thank you, Michael, was a selling point <clears throat> that gave us an advantage as well. And so they, they approved it. And so then now they've got a couple of sticky issues, right? One is where the heck are the tapes? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and it turns out somewhere in New York, Atlantic, and somewhere in the UK with okay with Mr. Page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, a part of the story not many people know is that um, Jimmy, of course, 
uh, was a busy guy and always has been, right? Got a lot of stuff going on. So, but he really wanted to make sure that, you know, these were approved and so forth. So he uh, designated a guy that he knew, a guy called Simon Pallet, a really wonderful chap, very discerning years. And so um, we had to send test pressings to Simon for him to listen to and approve on Jimmy and the band's behalf. So there was a level of scrutiny uh, that was there. So it wasn't the case that you could just go, well, we're just going to remaster this however we think it should be. Another point was that Classic always had the idea that we were really about authenticity. So oh. we really wanted to preserve what it, the, the special parts of what that recording was when it was transferred to vinyl, that experience. And what we wanted to do, and the story was, and that's what I think we were successful at, is by virtue of modern equipment and technology and care, mm -hmm. small runs, right? Which is not easy when you're, mm -hmm. if, if I had to make half a million Led Zeppelin fours, I think I just, I just go, no, I can't do that. Right. Because mm -hmm. It's just too big a job, right? Now you got you got to cut mul multiple and multiple and multiple sides, and you got to listen. Ah, it's but if you're doing five thousand or ten thousand, it's a mm -hmm. different story, right? You can mm -hmm. control it. So, so we wanted to bring that kind of attention to detail, and I think that was another big selling point mm -hmm. to these legacy heritage bands that are you know world renowned. It's like, hey, finally somebody's going to do this the way maybe it should have been done in the beginning. And I don't mean that what record companies did in the beginning was flawed. It's just, I'm, they were, they were making records for the mass market yeah. and that was mass format. Something they had, completely they different. Had plants all over the universe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, so, so anyway, but so in setting up this, let's call it quality control or approval process, <clears throat> it was taken a long time because you know, obviously not easy to communicate with Jim. He's all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it takes him time to communicate yeah. back. And plus there's a lot of other things, believe it or not, in Jimmy Page's world, not that I'm privy to, but that, you know, keep him busy that, you know, not just, you know, classic records, vinyl reissues. So it was taking a while. So it went on for God, well over a year. And I was in real close contact with Trenifold Management, some folks there. Uh, there was a woman, Honey Bianchi, and uh, I think she lives in Los Angeles now, but what a, what a wonderful person and very good at what she did at managing, you know, page and plant and, and a host of other things in a, in a small management company. It's really like a family, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, they came up with this idea, <clears throat> which was while you're waiting for, you know, to get this thing set up, how about doing the BBC sessions on okay. Bible? And we went, yeah, <laughs> because it had already been out, it had been remastered, so we had something to go from, mm -hmm. right? So we did the BBC sessions, and I'll tell you, you probably know this, that um, the, the BBC sessions, um, the, those records sell for very big money um, uh, now, and so... So that was the that was the beginning of the Led Zeppelin story. Ultimately, we got Simon on board, and we started, you know, with Led Zeppelin one, and and so forth and so on. And, and interestingly, back to um, back to the um, the, the the archive. Wow. Here's a really interesting thing that I had forgotten about, and it's the so-called Led Zeppelin uh, test pressing box, and it has. Um, it has uh, Led Zeppelin one. Here's a, here, this is our old stationery from the old days. It has, you know, the Led Zeppelin test pressing box. And uh, it has the first four records and the BBC. And they're all, they're all test pressings. And there, there weren't many of these, you know, so. When, that's when, will you, do, when will you do the repress of this one? Because I would love to pre-order that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, there's a few people you have to talk to before okay. that. Give me that number, I call them. I, I, I okay, exactly. <laughs> uh, 
you know, to be honest, I'm not sure whether that'll ever get done again. Um, I hope so, just because, you know, people are, are seeking those records yeah. and the prices are a little embarrassing to me to buy it, by the way. I, I don't take that as a source. To I, remember, I remember what Michael Fremer said on the panel mm -hmm. we did together about the kind of blue. He said, we, 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 we briefly talked about your Led Zeppelins and he said, remember, Michael, when they came out, people complained that they have to pay $35 for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I, I know a lot of people still, you know, send us messages and so forth and say, do you, hey, do you remember, remember do you remember in this case, <clears throat> initial, initial numbers for, from the first print? Do you remember that? How many you put out initially? You mean how many were pressed? Mm -hmm. In the first run. You remember? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm going to guess that um, I'm going to guess that about the first run of each of those was probably about 2,500, um, and it it varied. You know. And how long? How long does how long how long does it take to sell those 2,500 in, in the day? Actually, believe it or not, back in those days, it it wasn't you know, an immediate sellout. And, and <laughs> part of the reason That's is, I, 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 it's unbelievable nowadays. I imagine, know. imagine you, you, you do 2,500 nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> it would be an outrage. Know. Why only so few and then they will go this. <laughs> right. right. So, I, you know. <clears throat> and, and, and you are one of the person who started that off. Well. No doubt about that. You know, it, it was it was a love of the analog medium and the the recognition that um, digital was incredibly convenient mm -hmm. and actually sounds pretty darn good. You can consume digital these days, I think, um, yeah. some of the high resolution stuff. And of course, we did some of that too. Um, we put out this series of we called them DADs, digital audio discs, mm -hmm. and then HDADs, high, uh, uh, the heck was it? Hybrid digital audio discs. So it, in the second case, they had DVD audio. And um, so you, at DVD audio, you could do 24 bit, 192 kilohertz. And on regular DVD video, you uh, could do 24 bit, 96 kilohertz. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of some of the things that we put out. And I will tell you that if you listen to one of our 24 192s, and I'll give you an example, mm -hmm. Alan Parsons, iRobot. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we put that out at 33, at 45, mm -hmm. and on HDAD at uh, 24 bit, 192 kilohertz. And with the proper playback equipment, the 24192 is hard to beat with the 33 RPM vinyl. And I mean, if you've got the best vinyl playback in the world. Michael, I have been very heavy into streaming. I have my complete, uh, I didn't yeah. have the turntable, I had my complete Einstein audio uh, set up. I was streaming and streaming. And then I have the pleasure to know Volker Bohlmeier, who is uh, uh, the founder and head from Einstein Audio. Yeah. And I visit him every now and then. And then he put on vinyl. And then I had to, and I fought against it because I knew what happens if I go back into vinyl. I already knew what happens. And I, I really tried to get not back. But he puts them on. And I, have, I had to realize I will never get with streaming where I can get when it comes to perfect vinyl. I, th I think that's true, but I will tell you that at high bit rate with the proper equipment, and I want to put this into perspective. Sounds great. Those, those original RCA pressings from the early 60s, mm -hmm. like the Zarathustra mm -hmm. and so forth, you really never heard what was in those grooves until much later. I'm talking about until probably the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. when cartridges, tone arms, and turntables got to a, to a level of sophistication to be able to accurately reproduce what's in those groups. 
Exactly. Right? A lot Fun of bit. modulation. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of playback distortion that mm -hmm. gets then amplified through the system and played back in the speakers. And it can be really, really good. But when you get more of that, and that's what we're talking about with regard to 45s, but mm -hmm. the truth is digital high resolution, 24 bit, 192 kilohertz, especially on Alan Parsons, there are details that come out. Now, yes, it's not as warm. The, the sound stage is not as deep and so forth. Yes, all of that's the case. But I suspect that the same thing's true of some of the high resolution digital stuff. I don't know when, but I know over time it's gotten dramatically better. And there might come a time where time. It exactly. at least approaches. Yeah. Yeah. You never say never, of course. Of course. Right. Never. So that's, that's the only thing now. But when you, when, you, when, you, when you talk about the future, let me ask one thing, allow me, please. please. Is there any chance that we see Michael Hobson back in vinyl business, maybe no. as an, no, okay. <laughs> no, uh, and sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, you, no, were, no. you were thinking in terms of what, a consult? For, for example, in, in, in terms of what, what, uh, 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 what happens with the Blue Note tone curves, as, as a an, as an person who knows incredible much and can help other companies out, uh, for example, Universal, and we want to do now audiophile rock editions and, and something like the tone ports in, 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 in another direction. So I, I you know, I, I can't predict the future, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you a couple of things. One, there's zero chance I'll get back into molding plastic again. <laughs> uh, the, the market in the world's changed dramatically. The major labels are in it. There's a lot of reissue labels. There's a lot of competition for titles. Frankly, there's, in my estimation, there's not an enormous number of, of titles that haven't been touched, right? So I think we came in at a time and did things that had never been done before. And so we, we have that mark in history, which I'm, I'm proud of, I guess, in a certain way. Um, but I'm the type of person, and I think I may have mentioned this to you before, that I, I, when I get involved in something, um, I'm pretty fanatical and I go mm. to the nth degree. And then a little bit like songwriters who are, or musicians who do a release or a title or whatever. And then, you know, they get asked, <clears throat> what do you think about that? It's like, well, you know, I don't really think about that because I'm on to something else, right? I'm always looking forward. Mm. And I guess that's for me, um, it's, it's something I did and, or we did, you know, I didn't do it singly. It was a team of course. Of course. And, and, and the customers, the consumers supported it. And I'm so grateful for that. And that was then, and this is now. And frankly, the other thing is that I've moved on to something I think is uh, maybe possibly a little more important than vinyl. And I'll just caveat that by saying that I think music and the, and the vibratory information that it brings to the body not just to the ears, to the body, mm -hmm. I think is good for the cells, tissues, and organs in your body. And I think it's a way for us to maintain a level of health. Mm -hmm. So for me, what I'm on to now, which is water, and I'm, I'll shamelessly do a little plug for it. Um, we, I'm involved uh, in a spring in Southern Idaho that's gonna bring this really special water to okay. the world. Mm -hmm. that I think is good for people's health and longevity in the same way music is. And so I've been studying and, and involved in water for the last decade mm -hmm. uh, with after I sold classic records to Chad. So the long answer is I've got other things that I've moved on to. And um, cool. so, but that said, I wish you me, all the best. Thank you. And I'll send you some water when it comes out. It's it's. Um, I'm, 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 I'm quite it's interested. I'm quite interested in, in things like this. But uh, maybe before we uh, finish our beautiful round, yeah. um, I really, really hope that you find the right collector. That you really find the person who who keeps up your archive, and that we don't see those releases on a video or I want to sell them or over at Discogs. 
yeah, yeah. I, I know. Maybe, maybe one of my viewers knows that I want that collection. And I have the <laughs> means to do it. So I will, I will put a link of your. You will provide me the video where you talk about your archive, where the people can do their bidding, mm -hmm. and all the best. Right. Michael. And I just want to say that this, the intention of this is not a promotional thing, and it's not about Hobson making a bunch of money. And from my heart, I promise you this, that the money that is made off of the sale of this archive is going to go into the water business. It's okay. going into mm -hmm. something that I perceive to be good mm -hmm. for humanity, right? And that's the course that I'm on right now. I didn't realize it at the time, but I think Classic Records was the beginning of that journey, right? Mm -hmm. And I've been given so much, Michael, in my life. Um, I'm really humbled. It's time to give back, you know? And I think Classic Records was the start of that. And, and um, you know, it, it was successful and it continues on. It has life with uh, acoustic sounds and- Every every day on, on my turntable. It, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, and, I, and, and a lot of other turntables, of course. Yeah. So, you know, I just wanted to show a few other things. That yeah, great. Are pretty special. That are I, 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 I make you big now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it turns out, you know, with the who that we had plans on, because we have a good relationship with them, we had plans to put out the, but the entire catalog at 45. So, here is. Uh, who are you, right? Uh, it's a clarity test pressing box, and um, that's you know not that's something special. <laughs> not existent. Um, and uh, let's see what else I what other goodies I have here. Um, oh, I I won't go into great detail about this, but um, this is a a project that uh, was a labor of love, which you might know about the Everest catalog. All those classical recordings that were recorded by Burt White mm -hmm. for the Everest company uh, in the early 60s, mid, or early to mid 60s. And their whole idea was to do um, the same kind of thing that Mercury Living Presence was doing, mm -hmm. right? They did, mm -hmm. And they did recordings on 35 millimeter. Okay. So we never knew how good those things were because the pressings, what they did was they recorded the 35 millimeter and then they mixed down from the 35 uh -huh. to two channel. And then they cut them and pressed them and so forth. And the original Everest pressings, except for a few are noisy. They're, they uh -huh. just don't sound very good. So it's kind of like, and, and they weren't maybe the premier all the time artists that were on RCA and DECA and Columbia and so forth. But there were some very good recordings and very competent performances as well. But when they did this CD reissue in the 90, early 90s, late 80s, I think, all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, these recordings are amazing. They went back to the, to the three track 35 millimeter film. So at the end of the, the kind of the last hurrah for classic records in terms of new releases was doing a a series of these Everest recordings from the 35 millimeter tapes. And it's a story for another time about how hard it was and how expensive it was. I lost so much money, you have no idea. But we cut an enormous number of those, including the, the Beethoven cycle with Crips. But Here's a, a test pressing box of the Hindemith Concerto for Violin and Orchestra that came out as a 33 as part of the classic Everest series, but never at 45. And so the parts exist, they exist with Chad, but here is the 45 RPM test pressing of this and it's on clarity, right? So I, the reason I, it, I'm really proud of that, it didn't come out, but the sound is amazing because it really gets you that all of these records were cut directly from the 35 millimeter tape. In the same way I described how Grunman took the center channel and mixed it passively into the right and left on the fly, we did exactly the same thing and we cut them all at 45. There's a majesty 
um, I call it a majesticness of that comes from 35 millimeter. And when you cut it and play it back, all of that nuance, right, that's in those grooves properly played back is like, you really do feel like it's as close to being there as you possibly can be. So I, I just show you that. And then um, um, I think uh, this is one, this is the Casino Royale, right? I think this actually did come out and this just happens to be a, I don't think it came out on Clarity Vinyl though. So it's just a Clarity Vinyl test pressing box. We had planned on bringing that out and- uh, My God, impressive, impressive record. So, yeah, <laughs> a lot, of, a lot of, uh, of things that I have in my archive <clears throat> that whoever gets it and hopefully keeps it intact, but if they don't, you know, that's up to them. Um, situations change. They'll be getting things that um, virtually no one else in the universe has. And, uh, you know, if that's important to people. Uh, yeah. It is. yeah. Michael, thank you so much for sharing this insights with us. It's been a thank great you. pleasure. I hope that most, and I'm, I'm sure most of my viewers will this one enjoy as much as me. Very proud, very pleased that you bless us with your presence. So I'm just going to leave you with this last note. I, I can't resist. Um, I've, I've said before that um, a lot of the releases that we've done, 500 or something like that, um, there are many that I can't listen to, but there are a few that are <clears throat> uh, evergreens for listening. And um, this happens to be one of them, and it's part of the archive as well. Um, this is a single-sided, so this is the back side. You probably see it had a plate on it that says classic records, and then there's the logo. And that, that's the bottom plate. The flat plate has laser etched in it this information. And so it's, it's flat. And then, of course, this is the 45 RPM front. And this is uh, the single-sided um, 45 RPM cut of Stairway to Heaven. Ah. It, it never came out on Clarity, and uh, it was planned. But I actually did a, a late night listening session last night, which is why I look, you know, a little sketchy today. Um, I was up until 1.30 in the morning, and I ended the session uh, by... With this one? A friend of mine was here. I ended okay. the session by playing this. And, um, you know, we kind of sat silent for a few seconds <laughs> after. And we just so oh like my had, oh exactly. my michael records we will never get <laughs> so anyway it, i just want to say to you it's a real pleasure um my my intention really is that um everyone who would like to have an opportunity to have this collection and i recognize that not everybody has the means and and so forth and i don't want people to be put off by you know, thinking that this is some kind of an elitist thing where Hobson's going to cash in and make it's that's not what this is about. So um, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about some of these things. And I'd just really like to come back and talk um, with you at some other anytime, time. Uh, anytime. I hope, I hope we continue this uh, kind of, of talk. I, I think you have a lot to share and a lot of stories it's behind a, those releases. It's such a pleasure, you know. I just want people to really enjoy music and because um, I really do believe it's good for the soul. It is. Michael, thank you very much. Thank you, my friend, be well.